Hold on. Check. Ah, there we go. Okay. So now I've got the, the microphone issue fixed and hopefully you can actually hear me. I've got a little lapel mic that seems to work this time. Sorry about the audio not working on the first video. We're going to basically redo that whole video, so no worries, you're not going to miss anything. Let me get that volume control out of the way. We are going to do thematic mapping today and then cartography in the sense that we're going to make a finalized map product. Um, so these things kind of go hand in hand. You're going to style your map with symbology that's meaningful. It's connected to the data that exists. Um, connected to all the vector points that you've been digitizing. And we're going to use that data to actually manipulate the color and the shape of the individual points so that the data, the numbers that are in the background, are portrayed to the viewer of the map through those bits of color and through the size uh, of the symbols. Now, we're going to, like many things, uh, do a basic run through. There's obviously more you can do with all of these things, uh, but what we're going to do is just a couple of basic things just to get you down the road for project one. Uh, but just know that there is more that you can do than what I'm going to be able to show you in this 20 minute, half an hour video. Okay? So, with that all said, we are in QGIS. We have our um, background imagery. In this case, I went back to the Landsat 8 natural color pan sharpened. Uh, you could use the Bing imagery. There are some copyright issues about using Bing imagery behind your maps, so this is why I've given you essentially the uh, copyright free Landsat, uh, Landsat imagery to use as a background so you don't have any issues with that if you want to publish this, for example. Uh, I've zoomed into my survey square, which is this um, you know, white outlined area, and these are the Kurgons that I have uh, digitized, just like you've been digitizing your Kurgons in your survey area. Mine happened to be all in the northern part. I really did check the whole thing, um, uh, and this is the natural pattern. So before we go further, I'm just going to show you the data table. So if you go over to your layer panel, you right click on your Kurgon point shape file, uh, and then you go down to open attribute table you will get a table that should look much like this. It will have three columns, ID, which is just in there, K underscore type, and K underscore size. Now these are the columns that you made uh, when you initiated your vector um, table, right, when you uh, vector file. Uh, and if you don't see those columns, you made a mistake back then, so you're going to have to correct that, you're going to have to put that information in, you might have to change the name and that kind of stuff, and you have that kind of problem see me in class and I will help you fix all of that. But basically what we have is one column here, K-type, which has alphanumeric data or string data with M's, P's, R's, uh, etc. Uh, I happen to just have M's and P's in mind. Uh, that's mounted and possible, remember our, our codes. And then you have K-size, which is numeric data, which is the diameter of the Kurgan in meters. ID is also numeric, it's integer, but it's actually not meaningful. It's just a number you chose to you know, arbitrarily identify each one. Um, that could be useful in some situations, but it's not really going to be that useful here, except for maybe if you want to use labels, which we will get to. So, this is the data. Now we're going to make it show up over here in terms of color and size. So if we go back over here when we right click and go to properties, or we could have double clicked, clipped, double clicked on it to bring the properties tab up. We're familiar with this. We could go in, we could change the color to another color, and we would see once we hit apply, you know, all of them have changed uniformly, right? We could change the transparency, etc. Well, that's really nice if we just want to have a uniform color, but what if we want to have that color linked to the actual numbers in the table? Well, we can do that. Uh, in the style panel, we've been skipping over the top stuff over here, which says single symbol. If I click it, I see that I have several things that, um, that I can choose, right? What we're going to do is we're going to start with categorized, and then we're going to go to graduated. Now, the difference between these two is subtle but important. Categorized can be used with alphanumeric and numeric data, so with text and with numbers. Graduated can only be used with numbers. They do similar things but differently. Let's start with categorized, okay? Now you get a new looking 
kind of uh, interface here, something that seems uh, a little bit different. You know, lost all the little detail uh, about the color and all that kind of stuff. And that's because we're going to let the computer sort of choose specifically the colors. We're going to aid it in that regard, but it's going to do that first. So the thing that we have to do first is to select which column we want it to look for in terms of the data to choose those colors. So we're going to choose K type in this case. Now I only have two, you may have three or four in them. We're going to leave everything else the same, but we're going to go down here and click classify. And when we do that, all of a sudden now we see some new symbols. We see a blue, a red, and a green. The blue says M, the red says P, and the green is anything that doesn't have an M or a P is going to be green. Now I don't happen to have any of that, but it's just your overflow. Now when I hit apply and I move this out of the way, you can actually see all of my possible kurgons are in red. All of my mounted kurgons are in this sort of blue purplish color. That's pretty cool. And you're looking at that saying, hey, that's pretty neat. But those dots are really kind of small. Can I make them bigger? Well, of course you can, right? You just go up to where it says symbol, click it, and now you get all the same controls that you had before. You can increase the size over here. Let's make them four and hit apply. Now they're big, right? That's pretty cool. But now you see there's some overlap. Well, that's not great. Uh, what can I do about that? Well, we can go in here, we can click on our color, and we can increase the transparency of the interior portion while leaving the exterior portion uh, fully opaque. And we click OK, and we hit Apply. Well, it's not wanting to do that. Let's try and change the transparency here. And click Apply. There we go. Now we have it uh, exactly what we wanted. We can actually see some of the symbols that are behind some of the other symbols. Now you can see it categorized these into discrete categories. So we had just M's and we had just P's, right? With text, that's always the way it's going to be. Whatever the value is, it's going to create a discrete category. All the M's, all the R's, all the P's, whatever the symbol is or the, the, the actual code is, it's going to make those discrete. It's not going to overlap them. It's not going to create averages. It's not going to bin them. It's just going to create all the M's in one and all the P's in the other. So if we look at what happens when we put K size instead of um, the other one, so we'll, this says just do we want to delete K type, click yes. Every single value that we have is going to have its own color. All right? That means that all the tens, all kurgons that are 10 are going to have one color, all that are 15, 18, I had one that was 18, 20, 25, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Now, if I have a few of the categories, like a few categories, like only a few M's and a few P's, that made more sense. But when I have a whole bunch of categories, this is too much information to be able to make sense of. You're going to need to be peering back and forth between the legend, the key over here, and the, um, the actual colors, right? I just want to show you that the legend does show up over here in the map layer as well. Too much, too much, right? This is when we need to switch from categorized to graduated, okay? And again, um, oh, I should show you here we can change the color ramps if we wanted to. So this is random colors. If we wanted to, we could just do a, a ramp of colors like this. And now, in my opinion, that makes it even harder to see in this case because there's too many categories, right? Too many categories. So instead, what we want to do is reduce the number of categories by what, what's called binning. That means creating um, uh, high and low marks, and then in between those, we're just going to lump everything together. So let's say we made a cutoff at 20 and 30. That means 20 and 25 would be limped into, uh, lumped into one bin, all right? And to do that, we have to go to graduated, okay? Um, so we just switch to graduated. The same thing, we've got to pick our column. You'll see here that K type is no longer an option because you can't do this with uh, text data. You can only do the, um, the categorized one. So we're going to choose K size. And um, over here, we have classes. We have five classes and equal intervals. So we'll just hit classify, and we'll see we have now five classes. And in this case, the color ramp is blues. We could choose any other colors that we want. Automatically, it chooses a ramped color value from white through blue. Now, if we hit apply, we can see now that we have the bins showing up over here, right? 10 to 16, 16 to 22, 22 to 28, 28 to 34, 34 to 40. That's probably too many bins for the, the uh, Kurgan ranges that we have here. And it's still quite difficult. Um, five is 
probably pushing the limits of what the human uh, eyes can perceive and, and classify for themselves. So let's reduce the number of classes to, let's say, three. Now we see 10 to 20, 20 to 30, and 30 to 40. Those are nice sized bins. If we hit classify, the legend sort of updates, taking away the, the dots over there, but it's not that important. We click OK. And now we can actually make some sense. We've got light, medium, and dark. We have small kurgons, we have uh, medium kurgons in the light blue, and we have big kurgons in the dark blue. And by the way, my transparency values are still showing up over here. Now, let's say we don't want circles. Let's say we want a different shape. We can absolutely do that too. Again, we just go up to our symbol here. We hit change, simple, uh, simple marker. Whoops. I changed the size again over here. And if we go down, we can actually choose, let's say, squares or something like that. And we hit apply. See, I messed that up. Uh, simple marker. What did I do? I changed the size from map unit, I think, to pixels as far to millimeters is what we wanted. OK. There we go. So now we have squares instead of circles. So that might be cool. We might like that a lot. Now, what if we didn't want to do this in color, though? What if we wanted to do this in terms of the size of the squares or the size of the circles? We can absolutely do that as well. So we go back into our layer properties. We can leave everything the same. But here we find the tab that says method. Right now it says color. We're going to switch it to size. Okay? And now we can hit apply and just let it do its thing. And we have sizes from really, really teeny to medium to really, really big. Now, you may say, oh, the teeny ones are so small, I can't even really see what's going on. OK, we can change that as well. Now we have size from and size to. And we can make this big. Let's make it three. Hit apply. OK, that looks pretty good. It's made the sizes a little bit more interpretable. Um, maybe we want to change the color so that it's not just white. Well, we can do that here, too. Marker. Go to color, and we can choose any color that we want. I'm just going to pick this hideous green. OK, there we go. Uh, so I've just picked sort of random color ramps, and I've just kind of picked random colors here. But you should be a bit more thoughtful about your color choices when you do all of this kind of stuff. It's quite important to use your sort of design eye, your artistic eye. This green, for example, doesn't show up really nicely against the green background. So maybe I should choose something besides green, right? Maybe I should choose a contrasting color. Let's try a red, for example. And now I can see a little bit better, but the red is a little bit too luxurious, let's say, too saturated. It makes it hard to see the transparencies behind it. So maybe what I want is to change that to this sort of salmon-y color and click OK, OK, OK. And now that's starting to look OK, but it's also kind of the same color as this. So maybe what I need is to get all the way something totally different. I need to get into the blues again. And whoops. Click OK and OK. And maybe that's a little bit better. So what you need to do is go through iterations and choosing your colors. Now, there are ways to make the symbol size graduate and the colors graduate on a different color uh, column. But it's a little complex, and I don't want you to get too deep into trying to do that kind of stuff right now. So we're going to leave it at this. We can have the either do color graduated or, or categorized, or we can do um, the size graduated. Okay. Uh, we can do one more thing though that's not too terribly difficult, which is to put a label on it. So I've got my sizes here, and I want to now convey the information about Kurgan type. Okay. The easiest way to do this is to add a label. So we go back to our properties dialog. And now for the first time, we're going to leave our Style tab, and we're going to go to our Labels tab here. The first thing you see, it's all grayed out, because you have to go up here where it says No Labels and put Show Labels for this layer. And now, just like with our graduated uh, thematic uh, um, colors and symbols, we can choose our column. And let's pick K type in this particular case. Hit Apply, and just see what it looks like. It's put little black labels of MP, 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 MP all the way around here. Now, you may be kind of squinting and saying, I can barely read those things because the black doesn't show up that nicely. Well, 
you're in luck. You can format the text any way you want. You can pick the font, make it bold or italic. You can pick the color. So for example, what we could do is we could just make the color white. And that actually shows up pretty good in this regard. But maybe you want to do something a little bit fancier, a little bit more graphically or designing like, uh, you know, design like to make it look kind of pop a little bit more off the page. So let's turn the color back to black and go to where it says buffer. Here, I'll click the box that says draw text buffer and the buffer will be in white. What does that do? Well, basically, it does the interior in black and the exterior in white. And now it's really starting to pop. And we can do one more little thing that can make it pop even more, which is to have it have a shadow. Draw, drop, shadow. Leave everything the same here. Hit apply. And now you can see it starts to float above in a separate layer. And that's starting to look really, really cool. Um, the final thing that we can do is say maybe we don't want these M's and P's to be right on top of all of our um, symbols, maybe we want to have them be offset. Then we can go to the placement tab over here. By default, it will do cartographic. It'll try and automatically place them so that they don't overlap. And that usually does a pretty good job, but maybe we want them to be all uniform off to the upper right. Um, uh, that's where we can choose offset from point, and we can choose which direction we want them to be offset. Um, we'll just hit apply and we'll see they all kind of move. But if we want them to go further, we can actually enter in some coordinates over here in terms of map units or millimeters. I like to do it in millimeters. So let's do four millimeters to the right and four millimeters up. And then we see, boom, we can actually manually place them like that. Um, we can rotate them. If we have longer text, we want them to go 90 degrees. Now we can see them flip the other way. Now we don't want to do this with this particular one, but we can do that if we wanted to. Um, we can also try placing them around the point and again having them not do any overlaps and give it some distance here and have it do a bit more automatic splay, right? Now, you don't want them to get too far away from the points, especially when they're kind of crowded like this, because then it becomes very difficult for you to figure out which one is which. So let's take this back to about two, hit apply, hit OK. And that looks a little bit better. And it would look even better if we were to zoom in at a higher scale, right? So now they're really starting to be, uh, make a little bit more sense. So at this point, we have a styled thematic map with graduated uh, symbol sizes and labels for two different columns of information. We want to print this. We want to make this into a finalized map. We want to make our paper map that we're going to send to our colleagues or publish in our paper. Now. The cheap and dirty way to get any kind of map out of QGIS is to go to Project, Save as Image. And I'll give you a dialog, and you can save it as a JPEG down here, and that's fine. Um, but it's really literally going to just save what you're looking at here, which doesn't usually look that great, and it's going to be at a kind of a low resolution. You don't have a lot of control over everything. Now, you could put your decorations on here. You could put your North Arrow. You could put a grid if you wanted, even a copyright label. So you could have your basic map decorations. And if you're just trying to do something really quick, and it's not for publication, that could be fine. right? But that's not what we want to do. Instead, what we want to do is to create a final, nicely made, graphically designed map product. And QGIS provides tools for that in something called the Print Composer. Okay, So you go to your project, and you go to New Print Composer, and it will ask you for a title. You can give it something descriptive. I'm going to put final map right now. It will save this within your QGIS project file. So every time you open your QGIS project up, it will have the name of your different print composers. So if I make final map, it's going to open this window up, which I will come back to in just a second. But I'll go back to project and I will go to composer manager, and you will see it would have a list of a variety of composers here if you had more than one. So you can make a different set of map products themed in different ways, and QGIS saves all of that for you so you can print it again and manipulate it and change it, duplicate it and, and uh, you know, edit it a little bit moving forward. Um, so at this point, once you have your composer in the background, I suggest saving your QGIS project so that everything will be looking like this, the styles will be the same, your print composer project will be the same, and then you can go forward here uh, making your print composer. I'm going to move my face um, over here for now. 
but the first thing you see is this looks like a graphic design interface. It looks like Photoshop or Illustrator or something like that. And it has many of the same tools, but it's keyed in to the GIS to get the data over in to this sort of layout here. The first thing that you're going to want to do when you get this is to go to this side to where it says Composition and to Page Size. By default, it may show you A4, which is metric paper size. Um, let's change that to, well, well, let's change it to letter ANSI A, letter 8.5 by 11, since we're here in the United States. Um, we could actually do a custom size over here, entering the width in millimeters or inches, whatever we wanted to. But let's just go with a letter, because that's what we're doing. The first choice we have to make is, do we want to have this be a landscape orientation map, or do we want it to be a portrait orientation map? My survey area is long north to south. So my design eye says the map is going to look better if I orient it that way. This sort of landscape view is way too wide for the information I want to convey. So I'm going to change to portrait, and it flips it around for me automatically. OK? So the first thing we want to do is to add some frames to this. Now, frames are where graphical elements are going to be shown. Uh, and you can have as many frames as you want. The basic frame is this one right here which is essentially a map frame. And by default, right here, it's going to put whatever you're looking at back over here into this thing over here. Now we can add another frame that would have an overview map if you wanted to. It's a little complicated to do that. and You would have to have some other layers in your QGIS project to be able to make that work properly. But it is possible to do that. That's sort of an advanced topic, so we're going to leave that off to the side. First thing you will probably see is that, hey, this is way zoomed out. Um, also, you'll see Map 0 has popped up into this little window over here. Map 0 is this window over here. And um, really now what we can do is a couple of things. So we have these tools over here for select and move the actual whole window, which we can do here. And you'll see these red things have popped up. So now you can center it. The red lines are showing if it's centered on the page. You also have guides up here and little red lines that move as you move your mouse cursor around. So now we got our window centered on the page. Let's deal with some properties. So Map 0 is selected over here. We go to Item Properties. And now we can do things like update the preview to base. If we, if we change anything over here, we can update it over here. So for example, if we added another layer from our project over here, um, let's just add uh, I wonder if streams will show up over here. Yeah, so there's streams like this. And we go back to our map composer. It hasn't updated yet because you have to hit update preview, and now the streams show up. And if I move the streams down like this, uh, even to below survey units, and if I style the streams over here, move my face off to the side, and make them be uh, blue like this, and let's say, graduated into five categories based on my stroller stream order, classify like this, uh, oops, and base it on size, classify like this. And I want this to show up now in my final, in my map composer over here. I have to hit update preview and then we get it. Okay? So every time you make changes over here, you can make them show up over here by hitting Update Preview over here. Let's say we want to recenter the interior. This tool moves the whole frame around, but this tool moves just the interior around, like, like panning it around like this, right? So I can reframe the map inside my frame. Now I want to zoom in. I can do that in a couple of different ways. I can try zooming in even more over here and then trying to hit Update Preview. Um, but because of the difference in the orientation, it's not going to, you're going to have to zoom in a lot over there. You're not going to really know what you're getting. Better is to put a specific scale over here. So you see it said 41,096. Let's make it be a rounded 40,000. If I hit enter, see it zoomed in a little bit. Well, that's still not enough, so let's make it be 30,000. Hit enter. That's pretty good. I want to zoom in a little bit more to about 25,000. That's pretty good right there. Now, do I want this to be perfectly centered? Do I want it to be just off to the side? It depends on your, uh, your uh, final design that you want for the map. Now, I know I'm going to need a legend, a key over here, and probably at least a scale bar and maybe a north arrow. 
So I want to make a little space in the bottom corner for me to put the legend, okay? And I'm also seeing that the white lines don't look that great compared to the blue lines of the streams. So I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to change my survey units to be, um, let's see, instead of white, I'm going to make them be red, okay? And I'm going to, I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to increase the width just one notch. And it's going to look like that. And then I'm going to hit update preview and now I've got it. So this is looking pretty good to me for my final map product. What I need right now are map decorations. Now, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, right? Just because I could make purple psychedelic colors doesn't mean that I should. Just because I can put a map decoration in doesn't mean that I should. Restraint is the key here. Keeping everything simple and clean so that the message comes across, the one that you're trying to show. In this case, Kurgan type and Kurgan size. To add map decorations, you have a whole bunch of other little tools over here. Um, the basic one will be scale over here, which is like that. And then eventually a legend, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, I could add arrows, I could add images, shapes, all kinds of stuff. Text if I wanted to type into it, including a title if I thought the title was important. But uh, in this case, I'm going to start with a scale bar. You see by default, it styles it this way. If we select it over here and we go to our item properties, now we can actually change some actual properties about this. Here it says M. So if I go off here, you see barely in black 2000 M. Right? Firstly, um, maybe we don't want it to be meters. Maybe we want it to be um, kilometers. Right? And to do that, by default, we want to keep it the base unit in meters. We don't want to change it to feet or anything like that. But we want to change this label unit multiplier to be 1,000 because there are 1,000 meters in a kilometer. And then the label we're going to just change to km. Okay, and we'll see everything is updated down here. We have 0, 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, and 2. Well, how do we, and then it goes also off to the left over here. How do we change all of that? That's the segments over here. Left 2, right 4. Left of 0, 2, right of 0, 4. Well, let's change left of 0 to 0 because I'm not a big fan of going left like that. And right, we go up to 2 kilometers. Maybe I just want to have one kilometer, I can change it to that. So I have 0, 0 0.5, and 1 over here. I also have fixed width of 500 units. That's 500 meters, right? So these things kind of interact with each other over here. Let's say I wanted to change that to 1,000. Now I have 0, 1, 2 kilometers. I could go down to right 1, and I would just have 0 to 1 kilometer. So that's really cool, all right? I have pretty good control over that. Now I want to keep it at 500 so that I have right 2 so I have 0.5 and 1 that gives a little bit more information. I can move this around by the way um, and place it anywhere I want. Um, now you're probably saying I can barely read that text. Let's edit that. All right, fonts and colors. All right, here we can click on font. We can increase the size from 12 to let's say 16. We could change the font if we wanted to. We can make it bold like that. And we can actually change the font color itself. Um, we can pick white, for example. And now we can really read it in this particular case. Um, we can manually input the position and size if we wanted to. We could rotate it. Um, we don't want to do that necessarily. We could add a frame around it, a nice black block, uh, box. And we could add a background, a, a white or a black background, uh, or any colored background if we wanted to. If we really, really wanted to, um, we could also make it a little bit transparent, right? So that's kind of nice. It makes it stand out just a little bit. And I can try and put this right into the corner like that. And it kind of looks pretty good, even though the white's kind of on the road right there. Um, personally, probably what I would do in this particular case is to not have a background, to move my scale bar up and over just a little bit so that the white shows perfectly fine uh, against the background. Okay, what about adding a legend? Let's do that next. So we basically go over here, find our add new legend, and we draw a little box. And the first thing that's gonna happen is it's gonna look crazy. There's gonna be all this stuff in it, all right? And you can see every single layer that we have in our map that's back over here is gonna show 
up in our legend key exactly the way it shows up over here. Um, we do not want all of this stuff to occur in our legend. In particular, we don't want the color scheme for the, for the photograph in the background to show up. We just want to get rid of that. Now, by default, it says auto update, which means anything we change over there is going to change automatically. Uh, to gain some custom control over it, we need to turn that off. All right, so we uncheck auto update, and now we get all of these tools over here. We can highlight items in our um, legend key over here, and we can change them. The first thing we're going to do is highlight LS8 natural color and hit the minus sign to remove it. Ah, all of a sudden, that's looking a lot better. Now we just have the three items that we actually care about. Survey units, Professor Ulo Kurgans, and streams, all right? So first thing that we're going to want to do is to change the names of these things to be a little bit more meaningful than with our underscores. So we can just double click on them and we get this little thing up here and we can now put Kurgan, oops, Kurgan size, right? Click OK. And over here we can double click into these things and we can put little M for meters, right? We can do each one of these things individually and do it real quick. M for meter, M for meter right there, okay? Survey units, we can just change to survey unit because there's only one showing in this particular map. And streams, streams can be fine, but uh, this is actually strawler order. Strawler order. So let's do stream, stream strawler order, which is a, a, well, basically it's a hydrological ordering for large to small streams. And now we have this stuff looking pretty good over here. If we wanted to, we could just change that and go one, two, three, whoops, three, four, and we can just do five. And you can see you can change it any way you want. So now we have our legend over here, and it looks okay. It's kind of too tall for my um, enjoyment. So what I might want to do is to add a second column. And I can do that down here, going to column count two. And now we have two columns over here. And I can put it down here, and it seems to fit a little bit better. Um, one thing that we, what we might want to do is to change the spacing between all of these things. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is to change the title. I forgot to do this. To do, um, I'm just going to call this Prof Ula's Survey Unit. You can call it anything that you want, right? You can change the alignment to be center, right? So it goes right in the middle right there. Um, you can even have it text wrap or anything like that. And then what we're going to want to do is to go down to where it says spacing. Now we have a whole bunch of things. So we can add a little bit of space below the title. You see? I can just scroll up and down to. I can change. There's no groups in this particular thing, but I could change spacing there. Subgroups we do have. So for example, should be changing between the, there we go, the symbol space right there. You get a little breathing room between all of them. Um, we can move the text away from the icons. We can create a little space around the outside of the box and we can create some space between the columns just by changing these values over here. Now you want to make sure that it's all going to fit in your particular map area. So you may want to go back over here, select this thing, oops, oh, control Z, select this thing and move my whole map off to the side a little bit. And then I can grab this and sort of help sort of center it a little bit, uh, a little bit more nicely over there. Now, stream strawler order might be might be a little much for that guy over here, so let's just change to stream order like that. And now our columns are looking pretty good. All right, so you can see this is an iterative process. Um, you can actually move these things, their order around, so that they look a little bit better. If I want the stream order on the left, I can move it up like that. Um, I could move this down so that it shows like this. And I can play around with my spaces between all of these things so that I can get the spacing to look pretty nice on my, 
final output uh, map. I can also add a frame around it, which is pretty nice, like that. And I can make the frame a little thicker so that it looks pretty good like that. I'm going to have lots and lots of control. Now, um, there are a few other things that I can do. I can add a table. I can add arrows. I can add uh, like drawings on there, shapes, this kind of stuff, labels, and like I could put a title. Um, if I want to put a north arrow, there doesn't seem to be an item to put a north arrow. That's because it comes in as an image. So if you just click the add image, and then you draw a little box over here, what you're going to have to do is to go to the picture properties, and then go to where it says search directories. And bundled with it, just, it's going to take a little time, it says loading previews, Bundled with QGIS are a bunch of symbols that you can use to put on your maps, okay? Uh, and inside of this will be some north arrows buried down in here. Now, you could put a, a, a compass like that. Please don't do that. That's a pretty cheesy looking thing. Instead, try to find uh, more basic north arrow shapes, which should exist right about here in there. That's a decent one. That's a decent one. That's an okay one, right? We can change the colors of it, fill colors. We can make it white, for example. Um, we can give it an outline. For example, we can make the outline black, and we can make the outline a little bit whiter. And so that looks pretty good, all right? Something like this, for example. And we can change the size of it, make it bigger and make it smaller. North arrows are not always strictly necessary. In this particular case, it's kind of nice because there isn't an overview map, and we're zoomed in, so we kind of want to know which way is north. And basically, that's really kind of, kind of it at that point. Um, there are a few little things that we could do if we wanted to. For example, if this was a map that was not for publication but for field use, we might want to put a grid over the top, just like we did when we were digitizing our Kurgons. Well, we can do that over here. We can uh, add a new grid. Whoops. Grid 1. Draw grid 1. And then we can change the interval. So let's say every 50 meters or so. And instead of map units, we'll change it to, well, let's say map units. So map units must be smaller than meters, so let's change this to 500. All right, 500 meters or so. And there we go. We have a nice grid over it. Um, we could change, you know, we could have the crosses instead of that. We could have uh, dots. We can do all kinds of fun stuff like that change the CRS system if we wanted to, like we could put lat longitude grids if that makes sense. So if I'm going out there with a GPS unit, I can orient myself, I can offset the grid, I can make the lines look like anything that I want over here if I wanted to. Um, all the kinds of things that I showed you before with the grid. Um, the frame, we can have uh, little zebras on the outside, we'd have ticks on the outside like that. So this is just, uh, again, decorations. Again, restraint is key. Just because you can doesn't mean that you should. All right, we could change the thickness of the frame. Um, and we can actually draw coordinates all around it like that, which can be very helpful if you're out in the field. Now, in this particular case, the coordinates are going off my map. So I have to resize my map to fit in side the actual uh, page that I'm working on right here. And that would mean I would also have to move my scale bar, which I may not actually need anymore. And I might have to get rid of my symbols or make them smaller to make it fit or make the page bigger. All right, so you can see basically at this point how you can manipulate your, all of your maps any way you want to make a final cartographic uh, product. At this particular point, you should save your project, which will save your print composer. And you're going to want to now export this as an image, save it as a JPEG or perhaps a PNG is another good format. And uh, what you should do is in your directory, Talgar GIS data, create a new folder that says output maps with an underscore and spelled correctly. And inside this, you can now put a uh, field survey map with grid, anything like that. Click OK, any name you want to give it. You can change the resolution. 300 dpi is perfect for printing. 150 is fine for if it's just going to be viewed on the web. 
anything bigger than 300 dpi you have to have a really good reason like you're going to print it in, in in poster size in ultra high resolution and that the, pro, the printer is capable of doing that usually 300 dpi is fine then you click save and now if we go to our uh, project folder we have our new input for our output folder for output maps we have our field survey map with grid png and there we go it's a graphic i can now copy and paste this into my Word document that I'm writing my report on. I can upload it to my website. I can print it out as a poster. I can do anything I want at this particular point. And that basically does it. Uh, that's the basics of thematic mapping and making a basic cartographic product with the Print Composer in QGIS. Um, next time, we're going to come back with, uh, well, so we're going to start to change topics and we're going to start looking at GRASS, G-I-S, and we will do that next week. See you then.